Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Thanks for joining me for another plan and read with me as I read from the book Radical and Reckless When God's Love Disrupts Your Life by Unica Jonathan. Chapter 7 Rest in Love Look at the birds, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, careless in the care of God, and you count far more to him than birds. Matthew 6 verse 26 his command to rest is difficult because it goes against everything I've been taught about how to go about accomplishing things and how to win a race. His command to rest feels like taking away my contribution, efforts, and work. Ultimately, it's difficult to do because I have control issues. I have a hard time believing and trusting that he can take me to the final destination and results I desire. Can anyone relate to me? If you don't, then feel free to skip this chapter. But if anything I confess, resonates with you, even a tiny bit, keep reading. If God commands us to rest, the Sabbath, and experience all that he says, what keeps us from obeying? If you're like me, my first response would be that it's because there's not enough time in the week to do what we need to get done in six days. Day seven is a catch-up day. If we don't use it to catch up, it's only going to get worse the following week. But what if we dare to look a little deeper into our hearts and our minds. Will we find a different answer? Trust means you anchor your heart in the reality of God's awareness of your situation, that he sees more than you can ever see. Trust is believing that God, who loves you and is committed to you, will not disappoint you now or in the future if you put your weight fully on him. But more often than not, we don't trust his realities, initiatives, and provisions for us. We are afraid of failing and we don't trust him to sustain, protect, hold, and direct us. We don't trust the impact of his brand on us. We don't believe that he won't disappoint us. Why? because we have our own agenda. We trust what we see and know more than what he says. So, ultimately, our resting in him is a reflection of our trust in him. I like how Jesus laid out this idea in Matthew 6, verse 30 to 33 in the message version. If God gives such attention to the appearance of wildflowers, most of which are never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you, take pride in you, do his best for you? What I'm trying to do here is to get you to relax and not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. Steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out, you'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. When we are so preoccupied with getting things done, getting a raise, getting the house back in order, getting approval from others, getting customers, getting fill in the blank, you overlook God's giving of rest, approval, relationship, security, fulfillment, peace, contentment, joy, and all that actually matters. We cannot move forward in his purpose for our lives if we are not willing to trust him even when we cannot see. We need to spend time with him because we cannot assume that we know where we are going and how we will get there. Sometimes he shows us glimpses of it, only what we can handle, and even that is sometimes more than we can comprehend. So, surrendering our lives and time to him is for our good. It is for protection that he blindfolds us. Often, for what we are created and destined to be, we will need to develop our other senses. Jesus Christ is the Lion of Judah. We are secure in his broad shoulders. We need to feel his muscles move, listen to the way he breathes, hear the beating of his heart. He will be our eyes. He will be our voice. He will not let us fall. We were made to partner with him in this way. The sooner we surrender our need to see with our eyes, the sooner we will truly see more vividly through the supernatural gifts of our other senses. We will know 
where we're going and why and how because we are one with him i hear him saying come to me and rest let me hold you close feel my heart beating for you steady strong sure will you trust me will you let me lead take a moment to respond honestly to his invitation literally put this book down and respond Welcome back. You haven't missed anything. You've only gained something. My prayer is that you said yes because God's been looking forward to having you dwell with him. He rejoices when we accept the invitation. You have been on his mind and in his heart all your life but more so these past few days as you read this book. He hears your cries. He sees your heartache. His heart aches for you. He desires to heal you from the frustrations that come from relying on your own strength and not surrendering to his power within you. He wants to fill you up because you've been running on empty. But more importantly, he wants to show you what his love looks and feels like in the capacity that he has created you to be. When you say yes to his invitation, he will reveal to you more and more of who you really are and who you're called to be. One once you uncover that truth, you will need to experience its fullness and power to discern it from your own natural capacity. As you continue to grow in maturity and become more and more intimate with him, your natural capacity will melt away and you will draw solely from his supernatural source that never ends. He invites us to dwell, to live in or at a specified place with him. The phrase to live in implies a sense of permanence, a settling down. It also implies a place you call home that provides shelter, safety, and security. It is a place you return to as his beloved children are permanent, eternal place of residence is not only a matter of where, but also who. He is our dwelling place. In him, we will find rest and settle down. In him, we are home. I remember when I took my first child home from the hospital after being in the NICU for two weeks. I was at my wit's end. Being a first-time mom, I didn't realize the rest God provided for me during the two weeks prior when I was able to sleep several hours straight because the NICU took care of my infant who was born with special needs. Instead, I was upset and eager to take her home, care for her on my own. When the time came to do that, on my own was what I felt. I quickly thanked God for the rest, but proceeded to struggle with taking care of an infant who was born with Down syndrome. I wanted to care for her as perfectly as any first-time mom would care for their baby, but that meant if I got an hour of sleep within an eight-hour period, that was a good day. I was a walking time bomb of hormones and exhaustion waiting to explode. I finally came to the end of myself and I said to my husband, I've had enough. I'm taking the baby and I'm going home to my parents. Home was with my parents. In him, we are secure and protected. We will find safety under his wings. No matter how far we've gone, we can always return to him. In him, we can let our guard down and be vulnerable. In him, we can unwind and be replenished. In in him, our thirst and hunger will be satisfied. He's a good, good father, the perfect parent. In the same breath, we are his dwelling place. He chose to make his dwelling place within our hearts, not because we are worthy or qualified, but because we are his children. Whenever I go away on a business trip or short weekend trips with my husband, I miss my kids and look forward to going home to them for no reason other than the fact that they are my kids. They have my heart. We have the Father's heart and he calls us home. Take some time to read and reread the following scriptures. Then dwell with the Father on each one. Write down anything he shows you about himself and what it means for you.
Psalms 23 verse 6, the Passion Translation. So why would I fear the future? For your goodness and love pursue me all the days of my life. Then afterward, when my life is through, I will return to your glorious presence to be forever with you. Psalms 37 verse 3 to 4, the Passion Translation. Keep trusting in the Lord and do what is right in His eyes. Fix your heart on the promises of God and you will be secure, feasting on His faithfulness. Make God the utmost delight and pleasure of your life and He will provide for you what you desire the most. Psalm 46 verse 4 to 5, the message. River fountains splash joy, cooling God's city, the sacred haunt of the Most High. God lives here. The streets are safe. God at your service from the crack of dawn. Isaiah 57 verse 15, the New International Version. For this is what the High and Exalted One says, He who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with the one who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. 2 Timothy 1 verse 14, New International Version. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 to 20, the Passion Translation. Have you forgotten that your body is now the sacred temple of the Spirit of Holiness who lives in you? I hope one of the many things you took away from the time spent with your Heavenly Father is His holiness and yours by relation to Him. If you didn't get that from your time with Him through the scriptures above, don't worry, you're getting it now. He doesn't want you to miss out on this truth. You are set apart, special and distinct. That's what holy means. You're set apart to bear his image, his holiness, the way he created you to express and bear it so that when others see you, they see him. Holiness isn't something you earn. Holiness is something you receive when you choose to be his. How you live your life in obedience to him is a mark of your holiness, not a merit for holiness. One of my favorite authors of all time, Shea Bynes, says it best in her book, grace over grind. Rest in the empowering presence of God's grace as you work so that you are positioned for his supernatural ability which causes you to birth the ideas in your heart in a way that brings you extraordinary success, astonishes others, and gives glory to God. That's what resting produces in God's kingdom. Rest is anything but passive. It is actively positioning your yourself to be ever aware of his presence in your life and leaning into the limitless power that comes from that place. Next week, we'll be reading from chapter 8. It's not about you, but I am. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this weekly plan with me. Please click the notification bell, like, subscribe, and share. Thanks for watching, everyone.